The Habitsville Planetarium will change your life. At least that's what the latest Yelp review says. There's a five-star rating, pun not intended, just unavoidable, but not a single word in the space of a description. It is, surprisingly, the only available review for the facility. I'm not looking into the planetarium because I'm bored, or to know more about space, or because I'm looking for a cliché first date spot. My sudden interest in my town's planetarium is rooted in a phenomenon that I've been tracking for the past three months or so, ever since the Habitsville Planetarium's grand reopening six months ago. The population of Habitsville has decreased by one every month, every second Friday at 7 p.m. I know it may not seem like a lot. One person dead or gone a month could be considered low for a big city, but Habitsville is a small town where everyone's known everyone since they were born, and no one ever leaves. Since I'm not on a big story at the moment, I think the newfound trend requires my attention. The planetarium, up until six months ago, had been closed to the public for as long as I've been alive, but after recently acquiring some new funding, anonymous funding, as far as I can tell, they are now able to reopen to the public. And every second Friday night since, at 7 p.m., I've seen it. The count on the town of Habitsville's official website, right under population, ticks down by one. I won't begin to go into the details of my journey to find the human being that actually updates our town's website. It involves an incredibly long and perilous internet search, a day spent wandering around town, and eventually a fake address that led to an abandoned warehouse. But I know it's not a glitch in the system. People that I've known all my life, constants in my day-to-day, -day, are just... gone. Another one of my co-workers at the paper. My favorite waitress at the best restaurant in town. A guy I went to high school with. They've all disappeared. One a month for the past six months. And what do they all have in common? They all purchased tickets to the Habitsville Planetarium for the highly advertised Friday Night Special. A night amongst the stars. So there I was. Second Friday of the month, 7 p.m., sitting amongst the crowd in the darkened planetarium. I was nervous, to be sure, although I knew that it didn't make much sense. It was more of a hunch than any sort of hard evidence. There was still something frightening about being in the same place as the six people who had seemingly vanished off the face of the earth. There was a large crowd, which wasn't too unexpected. There are limited things to do in our small town, so people will take what they can get on a Friday night. It had tiered seating, dim lights on the walls. The main difference was the screen. It was magnificent. Rather than a flat display directly in front, it was a huge glass surface that stretched from the floor in the very front over the heads of the audience to the back. It was curved at the edges and reflected the little light in the room. Must have had some sort of glass coating over it, like a television screen. There was a family seated in front of me. A husband, wife, and two children. The kids were already impatient with their outing, and were bickering and smacking at each other as each parent tried their best to pretend it wasn't happening. When the boy let out a particularly loud squeal, the father snapped. Jamie, cut it out now, he said gruffly, grabbing the small boy's wrist and pushing his arm roughly back towards himself. I winced. I had seen this sort of parent before. Both children settled. The boy rubbed his wrist gingerly and giving his father an approachful look. Tim, don't be so rough with him, the mother said, though her voice wasn't exactly forceful. These kids act like animals, Tim muttered. He looked impatiently around the room. When is this thing going to start anyway? I've already had to take a leak. The woman sighed. Be patient, hon. I'm sure things are going to start up soon. The man sat lower in his chair for a second. A few moments passed in silence. Then the kids started tentatively playing again. When one smacked the other a little too hard, causing their sibling to let out a loud wail, the father stood up. That's it! Go into the bathroom! Then he walked out of the theater, leaving his wife to comfort his two small children. To be honest, I was thinking about going to the bathroom before the show started, but... Not wanting to run into Tim, I decided to stay put. It was a good thing I did. 
because a few moments after he left, a voice spoke through the speakers surrounding the audience. Good evening. The Habitsville Planetarium's very special event, A Night Amongst the Stars, is about to begin. Please silence your cell phones, sit back, and enjoy. There was a sound when the intercom turned off, a weird gust of air. I didn't pay any mind, thinking it was just the announcer's breath against a hot mic. I did as I was told, and soon the lights began to dim even lower. It was completely black above us, and the hush quickly fell over the crowd. I looked up at the great impressive screen before us, but for a while, nothing showed up. Then something odd happened. There was a moment, only a second or so, when the entire room felt strange. It was like that sensation as you're drifting off to sleep, where your mind begins to travel into dreamlike, illogical thoughts until suddenly you're jerked awake with a confused mind and a pounding heart. I looked around, trying to see if anyone had just felt what I had, but then the screen turned on and my attention was turned elsewhere. It was beautiful. The view was quite literally out of this world. It was different from the common way that we viewed space. Flat, lifeless, a black background dotted with spots of white. There was so much depth to it. The sense of eternity, of true infinity, is usually so out of reach to humanity, and yet here it was. Displayed before a crowd for a small fee of ten bucks per head. Even the children in front of me had calmed down. Their tiny heads tilted upwards, eyes reflecting the swirling designs of stars and dust that now filled their view. A calming female voice reverberated overhead. Welcome, citizens of Habitsville, to the Cupper Belt, located just outside the orbit of Neptune. This collection of icy asteroids is thought to be remnants left over from the very creation of the solar system. As the voice spoke, the view on the screen drifted lazily through the pieces of rock and particles that floated by weightlessly. Then the camera tilted slightly. It was strange. It was as though I could feel the tilt deep in my stomach, like watching a video from the point of view of someone on a roller coaster. Our bodies experience phantom sensations based on what we're looking at. That's what this was. Right? Coming into view now is the dwarf planet. Haumea. There on the horizon was an entire planet. It was oddly shaped, not like the usual planets you see in photographs or in sci-fi movies. It was unusually flat, like it had been a sphere until some giant hand came and smashed a fist out on top of it. Little is known about Haumea. What we do know is that it has an unusually elongated shape. It has two moons and an incredibly short day of a mere four hours. It is the fastest spinning large object in the solar system. If you look closely, you might be able to see the thin ring of debris that orbits the planet. Once she mentioned it, I could see. It was a wide circle around this huge rock which was spinning so fast I could actually see the movement. The bits and pieces in the ring weren't slow, either. The entire entity had the feeling that it was whizzing by, vibrating with some unseen energy. As we crept closer, I felt something strange. There was this deep rumbling at first. I thought it was the air conditioning of the planetarium, but as the film grew nearer to the planet, it grew stronger. I could feel it through my feet on the ground and my back against the seat. And then I heard it. Scrape. The audience's heads turned to the right of the theater. There had been a distinctive sound this time, a sharp scrape coming from the wall. What was that, Mommy? The small boy in front of me asked his mother. Nothing, sweetie, she said, though her face was lined with worry. Because of Humea's distance from the sun... It has a temperature of negative 241 degrees Celsius, or 
negative 402 degrees Fahrenheit. As the video passed through the last of the rocks that made up the ring, the rumbling I had felt deepened. It now reverberated in the hollow of my chest, and I could f even feel it in my teeth, and then straight. We all turned our heads to the left this time, as the squealing sound of metal being bent resounded from the other side of the theater. The children had shrunk down in their seats now, obviously frightened, but this time their mother offered no words of consolation. Since Humea's discovery in 2004, there has been no sign of life on the planet's surface. Until around two years ago. Scrape! The sound came from behind us now. We all twisted around to face the back, but only saw the back of the planetarium. My hands were shaking now, both from the heavy rumbling that was making it very difficult to hear the voice over the speakers and from my own fear. Then I saw something. It was a large black shape that traveled from the top of the screen overhead to the bottom at the very front. It was so quick it could have been a flicker of the film, but it didn't take up the whole space. And when it reached the front, we heard it again. Right there at the start of the theater. Straight! The following presentation is rated R. Viewer discretion is advised. We turned back around. Our attention turned to the sight in front of us. I heard the sound again. N not the scraping or the rumbling. That suction I heard at the very beginning, right after the speaker announced the start of the show. And then the woman in front of me screamed. Soon I saw him too, there, floating up and outward from somewhere behind the camera, arms and legs floating gracefully around him like the tendrils of a jellyfish, was... was Tim. His body was limp and blue. And he made his way closer to the screen. I could see that he had a layer of frost and ice over his skin. He came so near the surface of the glass that I thought he might... He might go off camera, but then I... Then he pressed against it. We could see him, sliding cold and hard against the curved glass like a bug caught on a windshield. His face was pressed against it now, his nose turning black at the end, a bit more pressure, and then... Then the tip merely broke off, floating back against his body and joining the ring that danced around Humea. The children and their mother were dumbstruck. Daddy? The small boy asked in a quiet voice. Then the shape came again, so fast and dark that I, I couldn't truly see it. I could, however, make out two distinct things. One, a long, scaled tail that dragged against the planetarium surface with a terrible scrape. Two, the wet, gaping mouth that spread wide and swallowed Tim whole. Then, as quickly as it came... It was gone. The voice overhead spoke again, politely and calmly. That concludes the Habitsville Planetarium's Friday Night Special, A Night Amongst the Stars. Please remain seated until the lights come back on in the theater. And we have made our descent. My wife has a twin sister. They aren't identical twins, just fraternal. But they still look very much alike. And if you didn't know them well, you could easily mistake one for the other from a distance. But Carrie and I have been married for six years. Their sister, Amber, just got married about six months ago to a guy named Steve. He seemed like a nice enough guy at first. Uh, a little aloof, maybe, but nice enough. Not the type of guy that I'd choose to hang around with. And since my wife and her sister are close, though, and since we all live in the same little Colorado town... I don't really have a choice. So we see each other regularly. It sounds like I'm getting ready to complain, but I'm not. There are definitely worse things than having to hang out with Amber and Steve. I've uh, always enjoyed Amber's company. I mean, she's a, a lot like Carrie, after all. And Steve isn't unpleasant. You know, he's just a little peculiar. Still... I was disappointed to learn that Steve wanted to take me up on this whole hunting lease for a weekend. And to be honest, I don't think it was Steve's idea. I think it was Carrie and Amber who came up with it so that the two of them could have the weekend to themselves, go shopping or 
whatever it is that they wanted to do together. I think Carrie was also hoping that Steve and I would bond better. She knew that we really didn't click and it would it'd make our gatherings better all around if we could just find a way to connect. Never mind that I didn't hunt anymore. I, I didn't even own a gun. But there was no way I could have said no. For the sake of everyone involved, I was going to spend the weekend up in the mountains in a little rustic cabin with Steve. With Carrie's encouragement, I got my mind right, and that Friday afternoon, Steve and I headed up to a mountain and into the wilderness. As usual, our conversations on the way up were uh, stilted. When we got to the cabin, which appeared to be pretty sturdy, though be it far from civilization, Steve headed inside without really giving me any direction about where to go or what to do, so I just hung out on the front porch. He came back out a minute or so later, carrying two rifles, and said something about needing to make sure that they were sighted correctly. Well, I went to go use the restroom, and when I came back, he was sitting in a rocking chair there on the porch. I sat in another, and we had the first of what would prove to be a recurring theme conversation. So, did you ever date Amber before you and Carrie got together? What a odd thing to say, out of the blue, I thought. No, I met Carrie first. I didn't meet Amber until after. He sort of grunted, staring off into the forest. Then he asked, What about after? Did you date her after? I've never dated Amber. She's my wife's sister. He grunted again, still staring into the wilderness. Finally, he suggested that we get a move on because it got dark in a hurry in the mountains. There was a split rail fence about 30 yards from the cabin, and there was a traditional bullseye target fastened to one of the posts. He asked me to go check that that target was secured tightly, so I did. And just as I touched the target, though, there came a booming crack from behind me, a rifle shot, and simultaneously, splinters flew from the rails not three feet from where I was standing. It scared the living shit out of me, and I flinched so hard that I, I almost fell over. I whirled around and glared back at the cabin, at Steve. He was just standing there, with one of his rifles resting on his shoulder, laughing. What the fuck are you doing? I screamed. Relax, he chuckled. Just joking, I sighted the guns last weekend. Shooting at me isn't a joke, it's, it's damn reckless. He sort of rolled his eyes. I apologize, I didn't mean to make you upset, just trying to have a little fun. You know, being a little off is one thing. Firing a, a high-powered rifle in the vicinity of somebody was something else entirely. I just about decided to demand that he take me home by the time that I had made it back to the cabin, but then I started thinking about the girls. This was going to be hard to explain, and it, it wasn't going to do any good for the bonding thing that Carrie had hoped for. Still, bonding or not, it wasn't worth getting shot at. I found him standing next to the sink, preparing to wash dishes. I marched over to him, still not quite sure what I was going to say, but he beat me to it. Look, I'm really sorry, he said. I'm an expert shot. No way were you in danger, but I get that you couldn't know that. I understand I shouldn't have done it. You scared the shit out of me. I know. He rinsed a pot under the faucet and set it in the drying rack. Just felt that we were a little tense. We're not the best of friends, and our wives sort of forced this on us. We're just trying to loosen things up. Yeah, well... I could feel my resolve breaking. Before I knew it, my hand had found its way to his shoulder and I patted it. It loosened my bowels, he laughed. You should have seen your face. And that's how it went for a little while. Friendly, jovial. We worked together on dinner, steaks and potatoes, nice and manly, and then we made a fire in the fireplace. I grabbed us a few beers from the fridge. We were relaxed there in the den, took in the tranquility. He was cleaning a pistol, large one, I think it was like a 45. Conversations was meandering along nicely, like any normal conversation would. Talked about his army days, he'd done two tours in Afghanistan. But he hadn't seen much action. He was earnest about it though, hearing him tell his stories made me feel a certain reverence for him. As I did towards all soldiers, he'd volunteered to put themselves in harm's way for the sake of our country. He finished cleaning his pistol, and then he loaded it. Then he set it on the end table next to his chair. It was about then that we heard a noise from outside, something indefinable but large sounding. He shushed me. 
He sort of smiled knowingly and picked up his pistol. A bear. A bear, he said. Probably smells our dinner and has come to see if there's any for him. A bear? A grizzly? Probably. Probably a black bear. Grizzlies don't usually come this far down this time of year. This far down? We didn't feel very far down to me, but then again, I wasn't accustomed to this kind of outing. No reason not to take him for his word. And not that it really mattered to me. I suppose a black bear could eat me just as well as a grizzly could. It would just take him a little longer. Steve got up and made his way towards the front door, creeping along quietly. It sounded like the bear had made its way into the front porch. I could hear his claws scratching on the floorboards, and I thought I could hear him breathing, sniffing, even grunting. Without any warning at all, Steve let out a loud yell as he banged the front door with an open palm. Like before, I flinched so hard I almost fell out of my chair. He opened the door and rushed onto the porch, which I thought was a terrible idea, though it was probably true that an unarmed bear was less threatening than a Taliban soldier. Then he fired several shots into the air. Get out of here, you crusty bastard, he yelled. Then he came back in and he closed the door. I sort of paused when he finally caught my eye, realized that he'd scared me again. Oh, I'm sorry, Jake. Didn't mean to frighten you. I know. I actually felt a little ashamed. I didn't need to grow a pair. He sort of laughed and retook his seat. Good thing the girls aren't around. If they were, we'd probably be packed up and headed back to town. Yeah, no shit. Especially Amber. She can get pretty freaky sometimes. You could feel the mood change instantly, like the air pressure in the room had dropped. What do you mean? He asked. Freaky. You know. Just freaky. She scares easy. He had the pistol in his lap. But I wish he'd put it away, like back in the gun safe where he'd put the rifles. On the one hand, there was a bear out there. What'd you think she's afraid of? He asked. All traces of mirth having left his voice. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think she's afraid of anything in particular. She just... She's just who she is. You know, she scares easy. For that matter, so does Carrie. I don't know why I single out Amber. Me neither. He sort of cocked his head to the side. Are you sure y'all didn't date? You and Amber? Of course I'm sure. Because it seems to me like maybe y'all did. This was bizarre. It, it was starting to become uncomfortable. Where did all this crap come from, anyway? Of course, it had been that time that I'd been in the hot tub with Carrie and Amber back in the early days. We'd all been drinking, things sort of gotten out of hand, but that wasn't... That hadn't lasted. And after a few months, the three of us had decided that, that probably wasn't a good idea for any of us to con continue down that path. And besides, I'd never, never been with Amber back then by herself. It had always been the three of us. It's a, except for, you know, except for a few times. Amber wouldn't have told anyone about those encounters, though. She wouldn't have wanted her sister to know. As far as that went, we had all agreed to keep those times as a threesome to ourselves. I couldn't imagine Amber telling someone she was dating. Least of all the man that she was going to marry. That, that she used to have... She wouldn't do that, would she? She knew it would hurt Carrie if she did, and as for the four of us, it would have made it terribly uncomfortable, especially for Steve. Surely she... She hadn't done something so stupid. Surely he... He didn't know. What are you doing with my wife, Jake? Good lord, that was more than just offensive as he sat there staring at me with a pistol in his lap. It was... It was menacing. I don't know where that's coming from, Steve. Carrie and I, we love each other. I mean, Carrie and Amber, they love each other. Why do you think any of us would do anything to hurt the others? He didn't say a word. He just sat there, eyes narrowed, staring at me. Finally, he sort of grunted, and then he reached the box of 45 shells and reloaded the two spent chambers in the pistol cylinder. The only sounds in the room were the occasional pop from the fire and the faint ticking of the mantle clock, which was partially hidden beneath the beard of a mounted bison head. Well, he began as he stood. I'm going to bed. You should probably get some sleep yourself. We need to head for the blind about an hour before sunup. Swear to God, getting to the blind on time was about the last thing on my mind just then. I was beginning to think that old Steve was a little imbalanced, and it was 
Plain as day that he had a bone to pick with me. Still, I couldn't imagine that he knew anything about me and Amber. It was clear he suspected, but surely that was due to some, some insecurity he had about himself or about his own, his own relationship with her. Surely she hadn't said anything to him. But surely not. I only sat up a few more minutes, thinking about everything that had transpired over the course of the afternoon and evening, considering whether or not I'd demand that he take me home in the morning as opposed to trudging through the snowy wilderness with him to a hunting blind. By that point, I couldn't imagine staying. I mean, given everything that had gone on, it would have been foolish to stay. My my biggest concern as I, as I went to bed was whether whether he would agree to take me back. The mattress on my little twin bed was hard and lumpy. I guess was that it hadn't been changed out in decades. And at any rate, it did little to help me sleep, which is going to be hard enough considering that Steve was in the next room with a loaded pistol. I'd actually had the thought that I should get one of the rifles and keep it in bed with me, you know, just in case. But he locked them up, which at the same time I'd thought a responsible thing to do. There were knives in the kitchen, but that would obviously be of little use in a gunfight. Bottom line is this was going to be a long night. At least I was warm. Sometime later, I'm not sure how long, I had begun to drift. I wasn't fully asleep, though, and suddenly I began to recognize that feeling. Feeling that I wasn't alone, that I was being watched. My eyes flew open, but it was totally dark. I lay there still and quiet, the hairs raised on my neck listening. Pretty soon I heard it breathing right next to my bed. I fumbled at my phone in a rush and finally managed to turn on the light. And sure enough, there stood Steve right next to me, still holding the pistol. What the fuck? I managed, flinching away from him. What are you doing? He didn't answer me. He just stood there with the pistol hanging towards the floor in his right hand. It was still warm in my room, but suddenly I felt cold, like a sheet of ice had been dragged across me from the inside. The moment wasn't completely surreal, but in it, I began to know real fear. This man was crazy. He was he was thinking about whether or not he should kill me, and I was completely defenseless. What's wrong? I asked. Trying to start some kind of conversation. Is there something wrong? Did the bear come back? You fucked my wife, didn't you? That wasn't exactly the conversation I had in mind, or at least it wasn't the one I was hoping for. Still, it was it was better if I kept him talking. I can't imagine why you'd think that. You did, didn't you? You know what that feels like, don't you? Steve. I don't know who you've been talking to. You're still fucking her, ain't you? He said that in a whisper. More like he'd been talking to himself. I don't know why, but that was... Even more menacing. Why do you think you have to have both of them? One ain't enough, aren't you? Aren't they pretty much the same? Or maybe that's it. Maybe you think that you... Maybe you think they are the same. And you're entitled to have whatever one of them that you choose. This was a nightmare. I, I couldn't believe I'd managed to get myself into the situation. That I'd allowed Carrie to get me into it. But I had... I started to say something else, anything, but before I managed another word, he raised the pistol and pointed directly at my forehead, not more than an inch from my skin. No! I screamed, wait, 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 wait! Is that my voice? Steve, wait! Shut the fuck up. Before I splatter your brains all over the wall. I did as I was told. Best as I could, anyway. But then I was almost whimpering, blubbering even. I was trying to hold it in, but failing miserably. At first, every thought in my mind merged into a great ball of white noise, one where language didn't exist, but then the noise began to abate in favor of distant words. Words like, like terror and survival and mercy and guilt. When was the last time you were with my wife? He seemed inordinarily calm, maybe because he, he was a soldier? What did you do? He couldn't know. 
He couldn't know. I've kept, I kept telling myself over and over, we'd been too careful. He couldn't know. Surely to God, she wouldn't tell. Even if she didn't care about hurting Steve, surely she wouldn't risk hurting Carrie. I swear to God, Steve, I don't know what you're talking about. I was all but sobbing by then, and my voice was barely more than a squeak. Please, please don't kill me. Please. He almost laughed. God, you're pathetic. I tell you what, Amber ought to be ashamed to let a little pussy like you be with her, and you really do need to grow a pair. Please, please, please what? Please put you out of your misery, because I can do that. Without even waiting for a beat for dramatic effect, he squeezed the trigger. I heard a solid clap of metal on metal, and then I screamed. It took me a second or two to comprehend that the chamber had been empty. Good grief, boy, he said with marked sarcasm. You need to change your diaper. He laughed. And then added, you don't really think I'd shoot you, did you? He laughed again, and then he started out of the room. He stopped in the doorway and turned back to face me, though his seriousness returned and said, If you're still here in the morning, I think I will kill you. With that, he disappeared into the darkness of the hallway. I collapsed into myself. The first thing I became aware of was that my body was covered with sweat and I was shivering cold. And the next thing? I pissed in my drawers. Normally, that would have been tremendously embarrassing, but, but there was nothing normal about what had just gone on. Son of a bitch was nuts. I had to get the fuck out. He said he thought he'd kill me if I was still there in the morning. I didn't know much, but I knew I wasn't sticking around to give him the opportunity. I got dressed as quick as I could, fumbling at the button and zipper on my jeans. My fingers felt as thick as little sausages. My heavy coat was in the den along with the rest of my stuff, but there was no way in hell I was risking going out there. I gladly sacrificed all the crap and the greater good, which was making sure that I made it out of the cabin alive. I put my phone, which had no reception just then, in the one pocket and my wallet in the other. Then I opened the window, quiet as I could, and crawled outside. The window was six or seven feet from the ground. I managed to fumble my way out of it, quite painfully, actually, but that didn't matter. Steve's window was just a few feet from mine, so I was pretty sure that he would have heard me fall. I scrambled to my feet. I took off running. I thought about heading down the road, and that would, that would obviously make me easy to find, so I headed for the woods instead. I knew there was at least one bear in the general vicinity, but somehow that seemed less of a threat. At least there was a moon. That, that coupled with the ambient light reflecting from the snow allowed me to see well enough. I didn't stop running until I made it to the edge of the woods, and then I crouched down behind a tree, and I looked back towards the cabin. At first, there was nothing. No sound, no signs of movement, but then that changed pretty quickly. The front door flew open, and out came Steve. Flashlight in one hand, his forty-five in the other. He ran off the porch, and then he stopped so that he could shine his light across the area. I ducked behind my tree best I could. Anyway, I tried to make myself small. The beam of light passed by me once. Twice. Then a third time. Then Steve called to me. Jake! Jake, you know there's a bear out there! It ain't safe! I couldn't wait any longer. I lost my nerve. I took off into the woods like a scared rabbit, not being careful about how much noise I was making. I didn't. It didn't take long for the beam of light to refocus in my area, which only motivated me to run faster. Jake, wait! You're gonna get lost as a bear! I had the presence of mind to change direction, to try to avoid the beam. I ran until my lungs started burning, and then I hid behind the roots of a large tree that had fallen over. I could see the beam of light shining through the trees to my right. Maybe I'd thrown him off my trail. Jake! Come back! It's too cold out here! You're gonna freeze to death! The beam of light kept moving through the forest. He hadn't turned where I turned. He kept going straight, and he was heading past me. Speaking of my trail, though, I felt certain that he'd figure out sooner or later that all he had to do was double back and find my tracks in the snow, and they'd lead him right to me. I couldn't stay where I was. I had to move. Jake, I'm sorry, Jake. I was just teasing. You know I wouldn't shoot you. I couldn't take off, though. I had to be calculating. I had to make sure that I stayed clear of him. But I had to work my way back towards the road. Otherwise, I could get lost. And getting lost could prove just as deadly as staying put. Jake! I heard him call me yet again, but then... There was silence. Then came another yell, but it was a different sense of urgency. Get out of here! Get out of here, you git! 
His words were followed by three gunshots in quick succession. Get fucked! Then two more gunshots. Then a growlish roar. Like that of a bear. And then a scream. It was like a... A blood-curdling scream, too. Like nothing I'd ever heard. Like, it, it made goose flesh rise up all over my body. Jake! I never heard my name like that before, either. And frankly, I never would again. It was ghoulish. Like Satan himself was ripping Steve's soul from his body. I heard another growl, then another scream, and finally, a scream that cut off right in the middle, like somebody had pulled its plug. I was mortified by it. Just like the rest of this evening had been, it, it was almost beyond belief, but I was virtually certain that I'd heard that demise of my brother-in-law, and in spite of everything he'd done, it was an awful thing to hear. In the moments that followed, I came to know true terror. I was afraid that I was going to hear Steve call for me again in some half-dead, terror-filled plea for help. He never did, though. Nor did I hear any more comment from the bear, assuming that's what it had been, and of course I was afraid that the bear was going to come for me next. And I didn't have any way to defend myself. Steve had a gun. Lots of good it had done for him. What chance would I have without any weapon at all? There weren't just bears in the forest either. There were probably all manners of creatures that would do me ill if given the chance. What was I going to do? What in the hell was I going to do? Before long, I started noticing how cold I was. I was bone cold, and I was shivering like crazy. I thought about going back to the cabin, but realized there was a chance Steve had only been wounded and had made it back to the cabin himself. I thought about, about getting up and moving to generate heat, but quickly dismissed that idea. I'd be asking for death by predator if I showed myself any more than was absolutely necessary. Finally, and only after I'd come close to giving up, I thought about Eskimos. Eskimos. I spent the next few minutes building snow walls up to the sides of the fallen tree trunk and its roots, building a space barely big enough for me to fit inside. And once I slid myself in, I built up the snow across the opening as high as I could. And then I wrapped myself up tight and waited. I, I waited for some animal to find me, or for Steve to call to me with some, some wraith-like voice, or for the sun to come up. By then I had come to realize that I was definitely not the master of my fate. Surprisingly, I managed to fall asleep. I spent the rest of the night drifting in and out of consciousness, fighting to go back under every time I came to. The night was long and desperate, but finally I woke up, and I found sunlight creeping in around the edges of my little cocoon. I was excited, almost deliriously thankful, and I burst through the side of the fortress and stood up in the new day. It was amazing how warm I stayed. It was almost counterintuitive that a, a shelter made of snow could keep you warm, but it had. Again... Again, I thought about going back to the cabin, maybe finding the keys to Steve's truck so I could drive off the mountain, but just like last night, I recognized the possibility that I might run into Steve. I knew the road was to my right, so I decided to head in that direction. I came across a pretty gruesome sight just a few hundred yards along the way, though, and it, it almost made me change direction. There, there was a... An area maybe eight or ten feet in diameter, and the snow was spattered with what I was, well, what I had thought was blood, frozen blood. It, I started to give the area a wide berth, but something caught my eye in its middle. I walked to it, and sure enough, it was Steve's gun. There was also several large pools of frozen blood next to it. If the blood was Steve's, I couldn't see how he could be alive. There's too much of it. Then I noticed a trail of blood-tainted snow leaving the area as though something had been dragged away. The trail grew fainter and fainter and disappeared, altogether maybe thirty feet from where I was standing. I shivered at the thought of what had gone on there last night, but I was clear that I couldn't be deterred. 
I had to find my way back to the road and then somehow to safety. I reached down and I picked up Steve's pistol. I remembered hearing five shots last night, which meant that there, there would have been one unspent bullet left. I flicked out the cylinder and dumped the casings into my hand, and sure enough, there was one unspent bullet. I put it back in the cylinder, closed it, so the bullet would be ready to fire, and then I started walking. It didn't take me long, maybe half an hour, to make my way up to the road. I was elated, to say the least. I hadn't been paying that close of attention when we'd driven up yesterday, but it seemed like it had been four or five miles at least from the last sign of humanity to the cabin. I started to feel warm as the sun rose higher, so I unzipped my jacket and I started walking down the road. I checked my phone for service intermittently, and about an hour later found that I finally had it. I tried to call Carrie first, but she didn't answer. I left her a voicemail explaining to call as soon as she could, that it was an emergency, but didn't give any details. This wasn't the sort of thing you left in a message. Next, I called 911, and after a few minutes of explaining, the operator felt comfortable that she understood where I was, so she sent someone my way. It shouldn't take too long, she said, to stay on the road so they can find me. Assuming nothing else went awry, it should be easy enough to accomplish, so I kept walking. Right down the center of the road. Since the apex of the crisis appeared to be behind me and survival seemed more certain, I began thinking about what had transpired the night before. It all started with Amber. With Steve essentially accusing me of having an affair with his wife, and he, he hadn't thought it was something past, but something present. He, th he thought I was fucking his wife, currently. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out why he'd think that. I mean, he certainly hadn't heard anything from me. I, I couldn't imagine a scenario that would have led Amber to tell him anything. Like I said, he, we've been extremely careful only meeting in times and places when and where we were as close as certain as possible that we wouldn't be found out. It would have almost been miraculous had either Steve or Terry caught us. Which got me wondering, maybe Amber had given something away. Maybe she'd gotten drunk, she let something slip, maybe she'd accidentally called him by my name when they had been together. That was hard for me to believe. Given what was at stake, her sister's love, I mean, surely she she wouldn't have been so reckless. Steve wasn't as close to Amber as Carrie was, nor was she as sharp as Carrie. And that's when it occurred to me. What if Carrie had figured it out? She was closer to Amber than anyone. And to me, too, for that matter. What if it had been impossible for Amber to keep it from her? Or what if she'd confronted Amber outright and Amber hadn't been able to lie? What if what if Carrie knew and she told Steve? Was that even possible? Would, would my Carrie do that? Would she prime Steve and then, and then send him up a mountain with me? Carrie knew I didn't like Steve that much. She knew I didn't like to hunt. Yet she'd been the one who'd set this whole thing up. She'd been the one who'd encouraged me to come encouraged hell now, now that I thought about it she insisted that I come no two ways about it she wanted me on this mountain she'd stayed after me until until I'd agreed to it would, would she do that would my wife the, the woman who's supposed to love me unconditionally actually do that to me first I heard it and then I saw the SUV coming towards me from the distance soon enough I could see the lights on the vehicle's roof it was my would-be rescuer, so I looked down at my phone. Carrie still hadn't called me back. Why wouldn't she have called me back? I stopped on the road and watched the SUV approach. I felt the weight of the pistol in my hand. And wondered... What the fuck was coming next? Yesterday, aliens visited my town. By visited, I really meant invaded. Stealthily, of course, but an invasion nonetheless. You aren't really a visitor when your primary purpose is to abduct and experiment upon a land's people, even if you plan to return them to their homes, without them ever knowing what happened. I was one such abductee, but unlike the others, I actually woke up while still aboard the alien ship. 
I don't know much about them. Couldn't tell you from what planet or even what galaxy they hail, nor can I offer any accurate evaluation of their technological superiority. I can only say that their tech is superior to ours. The jury's still out in regard to the cultural sophistication. I'm not sure whether to classify them as connoisseurs of high cosmic art or barbarians who glorify scenes of cataclysmic violence. On their ships, throughout every room I went into, were grand depictions of some monumentous event, a battle, a massacre, in which people of their kind fought some other hideously alien species. Neither were very similar in morphology to humans, but my abductors at least seemed to have been born of the same general idea that intelligent beings required consistent physical harm. The other species within the extra-mundane displays of art were abominable, shifting composites of aquatic and plant life. They appeared to fight with their various tendrils and tentacles, whereas the abducting species utilized what appeared to be lightning-spitting tridents. The aliens obsessed with this event led me to believe that a similar fate awaited Earth. That once they had a complete knowledge of our physiology, they'd begin a campaign of planetary genocide that would leave our cities as nothing more than miles-spanning piles of smoldering rubble. Whether or not this cataclysmic invasion will come to pass is not immediately relevant to my story, but worth mentioning nonetheless. I awoke in the midst of the aliens probing me, not inappropriately, while chattering to each other in their weird, ululating tongue. Whatever sleep-inducing agent they had used had already worn off. From what I gathered by their argumentative tones and gestures, there was an issue with their unseen method of transportation, causing a delay in my abduction. Luckily, as I learned from my glances at the other abductees suspended throughout the room by some anti-gravity field, their tranquilizing agents didn't cause the patient's eyes to close, for whatever reason. To them, I appeared to be sleeping as comfortably as the other humans, even as I stared into their heavy, six-lidded eyes. They patted me, lifted parts of me, even tickled sensitive areas, thank you, anesthetic, while charting and logging the information they sought. Afterwards, I was taken away from their brightly lit reception room and eventually placed within a small curved wall chamber illuminated dimly by a single tube-light light affixed into the ceiling. The light emitted by the tube was a somber red, reminiscent of a dying Christmas light. I was laid into a rather comfortable chair without restraint. I was still somewhat limp from the drugs, but could have moved with coordination if I had wanted to. But to keep up the perception that I was still under the sedative effects, I allowed my body to sag and flop about. The two workers who had carried me into the chamber tried to sit me in an upright position, but I kept intentionally falling over. I would have milked the moment all day, perhaps given them the impression that human bones were far more malleable than they might have thought, if I hadn't been allowed to completely fall out of the chair. In an alien grunt of frustration, they tucked me under the seat, like kicking a shirt under the bed when you're too lazy to bend down and pick it up. The door to the chamber was then shut and sealed and the light changed from moody crimson to a soft, eerily calming green. I heard other doors and other nearby chambers also shut and seal. There was no window in the chamber's door. Everything was green-tinted metal. Despite the awkward position I was in, I wasn't exactly uncomfortable, and I remained in that way until I felt that I had regained total control of my limbs. Once the effect of the drugs had worn off and full dexterity had returned to me, I started to climb out from my position beneath the chair, but before I could fully do so, a sound issued from unseen speakers, a sort of electronic buzzing that swirled throughout the small chamber. Disconcerted by the noise, I froze until it rose to a pitch that forced me to duck back under the seat and cover my ears. An instant later, the chamber flashed white, blinding me. It was as if I was staring at the sun for a minute. I had gazed out onto the snow-blasted fields after being locked in darkness for hours. For several moments, I saw nothing but white, until the vague outlines of the chamber's smooth and curved surfaces came into view. 
A few more moments later and I had mostly regained my sight, although the buzzing in my ears hadn't yet gone away. One element which had changed, and which was not some lingering result of the blinding light, was the color of the room's illumination. It had resumed the dark red from before, the light no longer the pacifying green. And just after I took notice of the red light's return, the doors locked, disengaged, and it came ajar. I heard a similar sound repeating down the corridor, the same sequence happening in the other chambers. I wasn't sure what the purpose of the white flash had been, but whatever it was, the process was now complete. I waited underneath the chair for at least a full minute, expecting the return of my guards. When no one arrived and no other sounds could be heard, I crawled out from beneath the chair and I rose to my feet. And I opened the heavy door. Unlike the interior of the chamber, the ship's corridor was bathed in a harsh yellow filtered light, which gave the air the impression of being polluted. They walked along the hall in which my chamber had been set and peered into the five other small rooms. Each was just as mine had been, lit by a red light with their doors now slightly ajar. Since I had been the last to be brought onto the ship, I assumed that the other people had already occupied those rooms prior to my placement in mine, although I couldn't guess at where they'd gone. Still a bit loopy-headed from the drugs, but in total possession of all my physical faculties, I crept along the opposite wall, going down the corridor which branched away from the one through which I had originally been brought. This series of chambers along the opposite wall ended and gave way to a wall-spanning observation window, which looked into a medical room of some kind. This room held various machines, terminals, and tables of equipment of purposes I won't ever bother trying to guess at. I also saw the splayed, flayed, and filleted bodies of humans that sat in steel chairs or piled in gruesome heaps atop large tables. There was an alien physician within the room, clad in a smock of some thin, silvery material. It was using a multi-bladed saw to sever portions of limbs from the stack of bodies, despite the resultant sprays of blood clearly being splashed onto the smock. It bore no stains. The crimson apparently absorbed into the fabric. I'd never had a, a tolerance for gruesomeness, so I ducked below the window and crouch walked beneath its vantage, not wanting to see another second of this butchery. I came to an intersection into the corridor. The rightward branch led down to the entrance of the aforementioned medical room and the doors of others. Unknown rooms were also present therein. To the left, the corridor terminated into a single door a few feet down with no others lining the sides. I took this path, not wanting to get caught by an alien who was so casually, mercilessly mutilating human beings. All of the doors I had seen, including the one to my chamber, were all the same. A complex locking mechanism affixed to their tops sealed them shut, although the one before me, it had been left ajar, intentionally or not. I opened it and... I left the yellow haze of the corridor. I, I stepped into a small, low ceiling area, presumably meant for storage, judging by the various metal crates and canisters neatly placed around the room. The light in this room was fairly normal. It was a soft white. It was unclear why the ceiling of this room came down so low, considering the alien seemed to be of an average height, or at least much taller than men. I had to stoop as I went deeper in. The supplies were all labeled, although I lacked the requisite xenolinguistic language to identify them. Within one small metal crate, which had been placed in a sort of podium in the back of the room, was a sphere about the size of a tennis ball. It was cold and smooth and entirely black. It reflected no light, and I couldn't tell if it was a solid piece of some glass-like material or if it had, if it had held something within. Scanning the room, I found other pedestals on which other spheres, also black, had been placed. Since there seemed to be no shortage of the strange objects, I figured one wouldn't be missed. I pocketed the orb nearest to me and quickly left the room, as my back had grown tired of the hunched posture. The terror and sense of vulnerability which had entered my heart at the sight of the medical atrocities only deepened with the discovery of the orb. There seemed to be some sinister significance to it being placed on what was clearly meant to be an altar. 
an altar in the room where the titan-heightened aliens would be forced to crawl on their knees to retrieve it. I started to think that there was some religious elements to the Ord, that they regarded it with some dark reverence. Still refusing to venture down the other side towards the entrance to the medical room, I made my way back to the area with the chambers, and backtracked from there to the room in which I had first arrived on the ship. I was on the verge of mental and physical exhaustion. I was suddenly afflicted with a feeling of lethargy, which I instantly attributed to the frequent change in lighting, for some reason suspecting that the colors denoted certain atmospheric conditions. The waiting room was empty, save for the bodies which floated in suspended animation like pillars of flesh around the room. I recognized none of these humans, and I couldn't immediately discern the purpose of them remaining in the room when all the others had been taken elsewhere. But if I'm being honest, I didn't really care. I just wanted to go home. There were no doors in this room beyond the one through which I had just passed, and aside from a few metallic cabinets, terminals, and movable tables, the room was bare. A large terminal sat against one wall with a multi-screen display that relayed images of a camera feed. The controls for the machine were incomprehensible, so I did the only thing I could do. About 45 seconds of button mashes later, the display began to show a recorded image. The footage showed the interior of the holding chambers. The feeds from all six rooms played simultaneously. In the first five rooms, people sat unconscious within chairs. In the sixth, I watched as my frustrated caretakers nudged me under my seat with their feet and depart thereafter. Moments later, the arrival of the white flash that had nearly blinded me. In the first five rooms, the tranquilized occupants had been instantly vaporized, leaving not even a speck of ash upon their untouched seats. In mine, I had survived the disintegration being underneath a chair. The source of the light-borne destruction was not obvious. Luckily, it had only been directed at the chair, and not flooded throughout the entirety of the room, if such a thing were even possible. The aliens who'd been ordered to dispose of me, being the clearly lazy workers they are, had probably planned on returning later and finishing me off by some other means. To them, I was no danger or cause for worry, due to the appearance of my unconsciousness. I mashed a few more buttons, and after, the display shifted between images of unfathomable alien conduct. It finally returned to the live footage of that same area, and as luck or Providence would have it, I saw the confirmation of my suspicion. The alien duo had returned carrying some sort of device, which, if I were to insinuate its purpose based on its design, they planned to use to bolt my body to the chair. My heart rate increased exponentially as I realized they'd soon know that I had escaped. Once they found out, the alarm would be raised, and I would have a ship of terrifying extrasolar giants searching for me. I doubted they'd still afford me an instant seemingly painless death. But things were going in my favor that night. The aliens who I had expected to howl or screech in surprise merely raised their four limbs upon seeing the empty room. Despite our differences in anatomy, it was pretty clear that this was the equivalent of a shoulder shrugging. They clearly assumed that the room's vacancy meant that I had fallen prey to the light's annihilating effects. They immediately walked away, slinging the two-handled tool casually between them. With the immediate worry of discovery assuaged, I again peered around the room, hoping to find something that could help me get off the ship. The room was rather uninteresting for a vessel belonging to an advanced alien civilization. Very functional, with not much extraterrestrial flair. Perplexed, I removed the black sphere from my pocket and gazed into it, hoping to glean some sort of meaning from its dull surface. It wasn't heavy about the weight of an apple, but even with a firm grip I sensed that it would be impossible for me to crush the thing. I squeezed it anyway, just to physically exert myself and relieve some of the stress. This elicited a change in the orb, like the various lights of the ship. It changed in color, it became a more solid blue. Nothing else accompanied this change, so after a few moments I squeezed it again. It became black. Without design or embellishment. A third squeeze brought another change in color, this time red. I had applied more pressure, and after further experimentation, I found out that pressure 
determine the color. It would always reset to black after changing colors. The harder squeezes resulted in warmer colors. Squeezing it my absolute hardest turned it a bright yellow, comparable to the urine-like tint of the corridor. The arrival of the yellow surface also elicited a change in the room. The bodies that floated around the room were suddenly enclosed within barely perceptible force fields of a, of a color not dissimilar to the sphere I held. I stood pretty much in the center of the room, equidistant from the bodies that encircled it. Upon approaching one of these bodies, the orb began vibrating, and when I was near enough to a body to be able to touch it, the orb's yellow flashing intensity and the body disappeared. I had first thought that I had just murdered a human being, using the same vaporizing technology employed by the dispersal chambers. However, a flashing light on the terminal beneath the body showed that an object, which had once been on the ship, was now somewhere else. The display showing various blueprints, map layouts, and tracked objects in a dizzying array of subscreens. I had not unintentionally murdered someone, I had, if I read the display correctly, sent them back to the surface of the planet. Realizing the responsibility I now had to my subdued companions, I went around the room and teleported the rest of them back to the surface. The displays beneath the terminal all seemed to show slightly different coordinates, so I hoped that I was sending everyone back to their respective homes. And once the last had gone, I quickly decided to perform the same kindness for myself. I had no idea how to suspend myself in midair as the others had been, but I didn't feel that it would really be necessary. The enveloping field of gold extended down to the floor of the room. I stepped into one at random, and the sphere vibrated intensely as my body painlessly passed through the golden shimmer. I wasn't sure if there would be any adverse effects of the ball entering the field, but decided to take the risk anyway. Before the full object had passed through, my vision went white and I felt a sudden sensation of disembodiment. When the light cleared, I was back in my room, standing atop my bed. The sphere was still in my hand, although it was, again, reverted back to its black color. I quickly placed it beneath my bed, hoping that the aliens were not capable of tracking the object, even though they had kept track of the transported humans. I crept back outside, and I peered up into the night's blackened sky. Among the clouds, no more than a dim, dark speck was what I believed to be the alien ship. I sat there, crouched on my porch, with a brick in my hand, waiting for any signs or physical sensations, anything that would tell me that the aliens were attempting to retake me. Ten or fifteen minutes passed before I became extremely drowsy and nodded off. A breeze blowing against my face woke me up, and I quickly returned my gaze to the stars. The ship, or what I thought was the ship, was no longer in the sky. After waiting for around twenty more minutes, I decided that they'd either left or had receded into the full coverage of the clouds. When I returned to my room and saw what was going on therein, I... I screamed like a jump-scared idiot. The black sphere was floating above my bed, albeit unsteadily. It rose and it fell as if drawn upwards by some weak magnetism. I watched first in horror, then in confusion, and finally in boredom. The force acting upon it was plainly of insignificant strength to draw it higher than a few feet. Feeling emboldened by this, I reached for the sphere. I was able to snatch it away with ease and felt only a tickling sensation in the space where it had been suspended. Once in my hand, it ceased to move. I didn't dare squeeze it, but I... I didn't, for the moment, fear any further influence. I would have gone right to bed, instilled with courage or apathy by my exhaustion, if the following event hadn't happened. A, a thin piece of metal the size of a tablet suddenly appeared on my pillow. It had manifested instantly and shimmered faintly within the same golden light that had accompanied my transportation back to Earth. The tablet surface was smooth, featureless, but upon picking it up to examine it more closely, words began to appear. They trailed along the surface like a message being typed across a screen, until the front of the tablet was fully covered. The message was in English, and was obviously directed at me. 
I managed to read it three times, rendered speechless by its contents before the words faded away. The tablet remained, although its metallic sheen gradually dimmed to a lifeless gray. The message, which I have committed to memory, read, You dirty little thief, you stupid two-arm troublemaker. Do you know how much of this ship's energy you expended in your little rescue operation? This isn't some galaxy-class vessel with nearly limitless supplies of fuel. No, you exhausted three-fourths of our reserves when you transported those other people and yourself back to the surface. I was going to let them go eventually, and when a refueling ship passed by the solar system. That's why they hadn't been blasted or turned into lunch. We don't even kill everyone we abduct, you idiot. We don't have the operational budget to cover up a town's worth of missing people. Next time, just ask politely to be set free, okay? Don't just go around stealing things and turning shit on. You don't see me landing down there, snatching car keys and siphoning gas, do you? No, because I'm not uncivilized. We barely have enough energy to get home. Don't break the ball while we're gone. I'll be back for it in a decade or two. Sincerely, Shane. I've always yearned to help others, to save the needy from suffering. You see, the world doesn't need imagined monsters. Plenty of real ones haunt humanity every day. Disease, poverty, oppression, all scarier than the demons and horror stories. So I thought. Seven years ago, the charity I worked for sent me to the Philippines to help a few villagers prepare evacuation plans in case of flooding. The poverty was bad enough. The first village lay next to a dirty, trash-soaked river. The Nipah houses rested and still stood upon caked mud amid a sprawling jungle. Two opposing tree stumps with perched buckets is how I described the basketball court. And despite this, the villagers exuded joy. During the afternoon siestas, men would gather on plastic tables and pass around coconut wine while playing cards or mahjong. And in the evening, they'd congregate in the village captain's house and sing 90s classics on the karaoke machine, sometimes until the roosters crowed. They got the nipa wood for the houses from mangroves that lined the river's edge like a wall of roots. As strong as the material was, a fierce flood could annihilate an entire nipa village in an hour. A successful evacuation required an easy path to the high ground, and so, from the comfort of my hotel suite in Cebu, I drew a route through the jungle and up the nearby mountain, which loomed over the village like a titan. Aside from that, I spent my time at the hotel phoning corporate social responsibility heads, usually while drinking whiskey in the bathtub, and after much cajoling, raised funds for rowboats, life vests, canned food, loudspeakers, and other essentials for surviving a flood. It was all going smoothly until I drove back to the village and presented my plan. The village captain, whom everyone called Grandmother because well, she was the eldest, had prepared a feast for me, which she'd cooked in literal holes in the grass. No one here is old enough, she said, while we were having lunch under billowing black clouds. But I remember what happened at the mountain. I loved eating on a banana leaf, but cupping the rice and meat with my hands still seemed so awkward. Good things, I hope. She hesitated, chewing her food slowly, then shook her head and said, Aswang lives there. I didn't speak Tagalog, nor the local language of that region. I simply stared back, my eyebrows raised. I'm sorry, uh, what was, what's an Aswang? The village captain told me a story. When she was a young girl, the village was located on the other side of the mountain, away from the river, and it was well off because the men worked at the mountain's tin mine, and the price of tin was high. But strange things began happening. A few men who went to work in the mine didn't come out quite the same. Some of the wives, specifically the pregnant ones, would claim that creatures called Oswong had taken their husbands' forms. They'd wake up in the night and see their husbands staring intently at their swollen bellies. Slobber 
dripping from their mouths. I laughed in the village captain's face, thinking it was a joke. How rude and foolish I was. But I had four other villages to deal with during that trip. I'm afraid there's no time to change the evacuation plan. Typhoon season is here, after all. The village captain persisted. Because of those Oswald, no baby were born in the village for a whole year. The monsters always disappeared before they could give birth. Only when the tin mine went bust and we relocated to this river did things return to normal. I understand your fears. I didn't. But it's the only high ground for miles. It even has caves for shelter, and it's an easy climb. There's simply no better place to save everyone's lives. The other villagers I talked to didn't share her concerns, which reassured me because if they believed such a ridiculous tale, I'd be forced to find another site. I stayed overnight, intending to practice my evacuation plan with everyone in the morning before I moved on to the next village, which was on a different island. But we'd never get to practice it. At sunrise, the sky bellowed open. Wind screamed and howled, as if some mighty god were blowing upon the world and flinging coconuts and papaya trees like twigs. The bulging river overflowed past the mangroves, and the stilts supporting the Nipa huts weren't sturdy enough to keep the water from sucking them up. The world knows this catastrophe as Typhoon Haiyan, but they called it Typhoon Yolanda there. Over 6,000 people died. Another 1,700 went missing. One of them because of me. Though I earnestly wanted to help, when the floodwaters surged with the wind scourge, I, I wished that I were back in my comfy hotel suite. But still, I did my job. As soon as the storm began, I gathered the villagers at the basketball court. Then we marched along a dirt path through the jungle and towards the mountain. I ensured the children, elderly and pregnant women among us, walked in front so they wouldn't get lagged behind. Because I would scouted it a few days ago, I knew that the trek to and up the mountain would be straightforward and winding paths brought us high enough where we could wait out the storm, watching the villagers huddle together amid the caverns, still cheerful despite the calamity. I finally felt that I'd done some good. So as I passed around blankets, canned food, and life vests, I realized how much more fulfilling this was, you know, than phoning corporate heads while drinking whiskey in a tub. It all started to go wrong when a young man came up to the village captain and me. I'd never forget his pockmarked and narrow face and the way that he waved his arms in panic as if he was trying to block a basketball shot. The village captain translated his pleading. His wife, his wife went to relieve herself and now she's missing. I pounced at another chance to help, to fulfill my heart's yearning, so I organized a search party amid apocalyptic rain and screeching winds. I and several other able men and women scouted the mountain where we failed to find her together. We divided into groups of two, and when that didn't work, we split up individually, each taking a life vest, flashlight, and blowhorn to alert each other in case of a danger. I decided to descend and search around the mountain's base. After 30 minutes trudging against the gale and through the mud, I discovered a wide cave within which was utter darkness. As I stared at the mouth, I heard a woman's whimper, followed by what I could only describe as a deep, throaty cough. One that lasted a few seconds too long. Was it simply the wind scathing the cave's walls? Hello? I shouted. Considered using the blowhorn, but decided to confirm what it was before alerting the others. I grabbed my flashlight and continued inside. A damp, fleshy smell shot into my nose. I called the woman's name. Pained whimpers sounded back. I hurried forward and stepped on something sharp that almost split my shoe. I pointed my flashlight at it. A broken cart track. I had entered a mine. Along me I saw wheelbarrows of ore covered in pounds of dust. 
tin mine. Immediately, I recalled the story of the Oswong that impersonated the miners. A tightness gripped my chest. I, I didn't believe in imagined monsters, but who knew what could have been awaiting in the darkness ahead? I wanted to turn and run, but I pushed on, reminding myself why I was here. To save people. The whimpering was just ahead. I wished I could snap my fingers and teleport back to the hotel where I could hide underneath the silky duvet of the super king bed. How, how cozy it would be to wait out the storm there. My heartbeat surged as I squeezed my flashlight to settle the trembles. I stepped onward and shined my light forward. A pregnant woman lay writhing on the floor. Above her stood the same pockmarked man who'd been waving his arms earlier. He hunched over her, his mouth widened and slobber dripping from it. Hello, I said. G Glad you found her. Is she all right? He ignored me. His mouth stretched beyond that what was humanly possible while emitting a throaty wail and then a hand slithered out of his mouth. The arm the hand was attached to had three elbows, and they bent at odd angles as it stretched towards the woman's right belly. I pulled out my blowhorn and pressed it. It blared like the trumpet of Judgment Day, echoing against the cave walls. The thing snapped its head towards me, the hand coming out of its mouth contorted with bony snaps until all three elbows straightened. It grabbed at my face, just missing as I backed away and turned. I'd said that I'd always wanted to help people, but in that moment, as my heart quavered and panic engulfed my every sense, I only wanted to help myself. I... I ran. I ran until I was out of the cave and breathless, back amidst the, the deluge. Instead of climbing up the mountain, I sprinted toward the jungle, towards the village which was nearly submerged and drifting with the tide. Water reached my waist, but still I trudged through, my life vest keeping me from drowning, and then the, the current swept me. It carried me up through a thicket of downed trees, washed away Nipa huts and plastic. Though terrifying, this was heaven, compared to facing the creatures in the cave. Half an hour later, some brave volunteers in a paddle boat rescued me. I told them I was running from an Oswong, but they laughed, thinking me some crazy foreigner. I spent a few days in a shelter. And then I returned to Kebu. Resigned from the charity, and once the storm had passed, I took the first flight home. While later I heard from a colleague that the villagers survived, save for one pregnant woman who'd gone missing. I've had seven years to think about it since then. But my conclusion never changes. By ignoring the village captain's warning and guiding them to that cursed mountain, I caused something unmentionable to happen to that woman and her unborn child. I'd done... I'd done exactly the opposite of what I yearned to do. I'd hurt instead of helped because of my arrogance. The guilt still eats me. I don't dare try to help anyone anymore. I'm a corporate drone now. Slaving every day to make someone else rich. And that's all better than hurting others with my good intentions. This is Ben. I used to work for a charity in the Philippines. I never want to help people again. By Zamil Akhtar. To find more from Zamil Akhtar, check out the website in the description down below. It's good to be home. You know, after the, uh, frankly, insane events of the past month or so, it's nothing like settling back in a comfortable life of a small town newspaper reporter. Except, of course, that small town is Habitsville. We're prone to the strange here. You know, 
no fault of our own. Bizarre things just seem to happen, and just like clockwork, they're happening again. It came to me by word of mouth, but as far as I can tell, it started with a sign. I walked by the bakery myself just to be sure. And there it was, hanging in the window. It was small, white, and plain, but the words on it stood out in an unnatural way. I should have missed the phrase when I was walking by, but instead found that it commanded my absolute attention. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. An odd sort of laugh rose in my throat when I actually saw it, because up until that post, I thought Heather had lost her mind. Heather is my primary co-worker at Habitsville Gazette. We're good friends. We often talk about everything from our pieces from the paper to what shows we're binging on Netflix. I know her pretty well, which is why it was strange when she suddenly said something extremely out of character, mid-conversation. She had been talking about her parents coming to visit from a few towns over, and how cautious they always were when it came to Habitsville, as visitors often are. We were packing up our things for the day before we went home when she said, My parents should be here Thursday, which is way too soon. The apartment's a mess, and it's too small to fit all of us anyway. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. But how do you tell your parents they should get a hotel outside of town? I asked her what she meant. But as you might be able to guess, she had no idea what I was talking about. I even repeated the phrase back to her. Not a hint of recognition appeared in her eyes. I went home, and after a while, I forgot about it. But then, then I heard it again. Stepping outside of my house for work the following morning, I spotted my mailman, Phil, putting a few envelopes into my mailbox. I waved to him and said good morning, and like any polite person, he answered, Good morning! Butternut Bakery doesn't serve human flesh! He held his smile as though he hadn't said anything strange, and cheerfully moved on to my neighbor's mailbox. I, however, I was deeply confused. I felt like... Some sort of prank, but I had no idea who would orchestrate it and why. I heard it again later that day. In fact, I heard it 17 more times. Some people repeated it, some only said it once. I don't have a transcript from an interview I was supposed to be doing with an old woman who just turned 102. Where there, right in the middle of her sentence about her great-grandkids, was the phrase, The butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I hadn't heard it when she said it, but it was there typed out in my notes. So there I was, clocking out early on a Tuesday afternoon just so I could stand in front of this bakery. I was bewildered, but not just because of the phrase, though that was a bizarre one on its own. See, I lived in Habitsville my entire life, and not once have I ever heard of a place called Butternut Bakery. And yet, an afternoon spent wandering the streets of my own hometown, I found a new shop right there in the middle of the main strip. It's a small building, but not so small that I would miss it. The building itself had an inviting burnt orange color, and the yellow lights inside made the entire place look warm and enticing. The smell of baked goods drifted out and over the pavement to where I stood on the other side of the street, fighting the overwhelming urge to go inside. Because there was the sign, wasn't there? The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. It seemed like such an odd thing for a bakery to have to clarify. I mean, maybe it was some sort of fun reference to Sweeney Todd? But that doesn't, that's not exactly an appealing allusion to make to potential customers. But there was something about the sign, something about the phrase. It was like, the more that I heard or read it, the less odd it seemed. The butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. Of course it doesn't. No bakeries do, or should. It's just good advertising to make the fact clear. I didn't see anyone walk in or out of the bakery for around 15 minutes, though. Plenty of people walked down the sidewalk. I mean, it was strange. Even the window shoppers that were strolling from display to display didn't bother to stop at the bakery. It was the late afternoon when someone might want to grab a snack or a late lunch, but no one gave it a second look. They didn't even seem to notice the smell, which was becoming more distracting by the second. My stomach began to growl as I caught another nostril full. And then, 
I saw someone emerge from the bakery. I had to squint, and it was hard to recognize him outside of his uniform, but I could still tell it was Phil, my mailman. He stepped out of the bakery holding a small bag and immediately began to walk down the sidewalk. I crossed the street and approached, walking behind him. Phil! I called out in a friendly manner. Oddly, he didn't respond. I thought perhaps he didn't hear me, so I walked faster until I was beside him. Phil. At the second call of his name, Phil stopped and turned to look at me. He smiled when he recognized me. Oh, Mr. Singer! Funny running into you here! There was tone to suggest that he were having a normal run-in on the street. It was anything of the sort. There were markings drawn on his face, as though he was about to have some sort of cosmetic surgery. There were long strips drawn around his cheeks. I could see some ink was peeking out from the circles that marked his ears. But as it turned out, that wasn't the oddest part of Phil's appearance. I had thought it was his bag that had been dripping. Something dark that trailed from the door of the bakery to where he stood now. But since we had stilled, the trickle only came faster and began to pool in a puddle around our feet. It wasn't hard to miss the source. Framed by the frayed edges of the shirt he wore, I could see that there was a large chunk of flesh missing from Phil's shoulder. Not like he had a bad wound that needed to be sewn up. There was there was nothing to sew. It was a scoop out of his body, and I could see the tip of his shoulder bones poking out where they connected at the socket. I, I didn't know what to say. There was no trace of pain on his face. There was no signal that he even knew what he was walking around with. And oddly enough, no one on the street seemed to notice either. I had a brief rush of fear as I considered that perhaps I had lost my own sanity and then... And then he said it. I just picked up a treat for myself. The butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I've just finished my route for the day. He unraveled the folded up opening to his bag and held it out to me. Do you like to try? I tore my eyes away from the gory wound on his torso and instead peered into his bag. On the bottom, as, as innocent as it could be, it was a medium sized pastry. It was a pocket style, crimped around the edges, no doubt with some sort of filling inside. My stomach was turning violently now, and I just shook my head at Phil. Suit yourself. This is the second time I've been this week. It's terrible for my diet, but it's just so good, he said with a chuckle. The butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I'll see you tomorrow morning, then. With that, he turned and continued down the pavement, walking with a limp I'd never known him to have before. I walked to the front of the bakery, despite the warm glow coming from inside. The windows were not well suited for display. The glass had some sort of coating on it, and although I could see the light shining through and dark shapes moving around inside, I couldn't make anything out. I was so focused on seeing inside that I didn't notice when someone had opened the door. The small bell at the top jingled, and, and I looked up. It was Heather. I lurched forward, grabbing her by the hand. She flinched in shock, and then half laughed. Sam, God, you scared me. The butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. Are you going inside? She motioned into the open doorway, and I looked inside. It's difficult to describe what I saw inside the butternut bakery, mostly because the inside scene with the naked eye was strangely similar to the view through the glass. There was this hazy film over everything. The only two certain sights could be gleaned. The bright yellow light and dark shadows moving around in the back. You shouldn't go in there, Heather, I said, thinking of Phil's monstrous wound. I know this sounds crazy, I know. I, I took a deep breath and said, but I think the butternut bakery is serving human flesh. Or at least, that's what I meant to say. I could hear the words as they came from my lips, though they were not the ones I had chosen at all. I said, But I think the butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I stood there, horrified. Heather furrowed her brow at me. One foot stood on the doorstep of the building. 
Yes, yeah, Sam. I know. You told me before, the butternut bakery does not serve human flesh. I think it's great. I blinked. I... I told you before? The fear that was rising within me was quickly turning to panic. I thought Heather had been the first one to say the phrase to me only a few days before, and never did I think I had said it back to her. What? When you mentioned it a few days ago? Her frown deepened. You've been talking about the bakery for over a month, Sam. I have? I mean, it's not much of a discussion. You pretty much just say the same thing every time. She leans back out of the door and pointed to that sign that hung in the window. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. As I stood there, spiraling, Heather looked down at my hand, which it still clasped firmly on her wrist. Now, if you'll excuse me, you're being weird. And I'm hungry. This shook me from my days. I couldn't let what had happened to Phil happen to Heather. I pulled hard on her wrist, and she took another step forward into the interior of the building. I tried to warn her, tried to say, I just saw my mailman come out of there with a huge piece of his body missing. Just missing, Heather. You, you can't go in there. I don't know what's going on, but it's dangerous. That's what I tried to say. But deep down, I knew what was going to come out. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. 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 I pulled Heather even harder, and she fought back with as much force as she could. The shadows in the back of the bakery were moving faster now, even buzzing around the edges. Each were vibrating violently with some unseen energy. The yellow glow of the lights burned brighter, so bright I had to squint. I thought of the blood trail I had seen dripping from Phil's shoulder, the exposed bone and ligaments peeking through the mangled skin, the, the butcher lines drawn on his face, and I I pulled with all my might. Heather lost her footing. We fell backwards, one on top of the other, hard on the pavement. The door she had pulled open slammed, as though sucked by a vacuum, and when it did, the bell at the top jingled violently, and the entire building jumped with the force of the closure. It was that flinch, that slammed door, that made the sign fall from the window. I saw the words. The Butternut Bakery does not serve human flesh. One last time in plain black text on a white background. Then I blinked. And it was gone. Not just the fallen sign. No, the, the entire... The entire building was gone. People were walking by us now as though they hadn't seen what had happened. Instead, they only gave us odd looks and stepped over our bodies. I sat up. I looked around. The main street of Habitsville was just as I had always known it. Before I had heard of that place. I wondered. I don't dare speak again. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's podcast on the podcast, if you're listening to that there at Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you can happen to listen to podcasts. I also want to tell you guys, if you look in the description, there's a lot of really cool things that you can always see down there, including uh, links over to two Creepypasta books that I curated that are available now on Amazon. Check those out, the Creepypasta Collection Volume 1 and Volume 2. Great for people that like horror, or creepypastas, or people who listen to this podcast. And of course, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who checks out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta and supports the show, keeps the light on, gives me treats for my now two cats, both Hylas and Hercules. Both of them are a handful. And especially a big thank you to Haha Saha, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mazakin, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chambinski, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Hades Nephew, Carter Barenfanger, Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradney Lipe, The Government Monitoring System, Anne Charon, Rumble Fox, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Rafael Rodriguez, Dan Sweet, Mad Marshdomp, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Sean Mills, Brian Ars, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Somber Puppet, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, 
Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Patrick Schoolmeister, Thomas Burgett, Barbara Maceo, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, The Homeless Bird 93, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, and Corey X Kenshin. A big thank you to all of you guys and everybody down there in the description. I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody who listens, sweet dreams. <laughs>